Full transparency, this is round three of recording this, and if this doesn't work, I don't know if this video will ever see the light of day. I first picked up a film camera in 2018, and since then, I have been shooting on a little point and shoot camera. I love it, it's one of the best things I do. However, in that time, I have made a lot of mistakes, especially when I was starting out. So I thought it might be nice to share some of them with you so you can avoid them and save yourself some time and money. Lord knows I would have benefited from that. Ultimately, shooting on film will always be a learning curve, but if I can help you to not make some of the errors that I made, I'll be a happy woman. If you're brand new to film and you'd like to know all the basics, I've actually made a video with a full guide. I will link it either up here or in the description, or both. We'll see. The first mistake I made is I did not load the film properly. I've made this error. I've had friends make this error. It is so painful. You take your camera on holiday. You think you shot the perfect roll just to get home. Think, hmm, I feel like I shot a bit more than I should have. Open the back, realize the film never rolled across. Mmm, infuriating. The way that I avoid this now is I make sure that when I load my film, I push the film tab along across the back of the camera so that it's got every best chance of catching the spool. The spool is what pulls the film over to the next uh, photo. <laughs> Does that make any sense? In general, if you have a manual camera like this one, you will have a kind of ticker dial at the top which tells you which photo you're on. You will see that move if the spool has picked up the film. On cameras which are slightly newer, this one's from the late 90s, they have an automatic ticker and like, it's harder to tell, I think. But on these ones from the 80s and early 90s, it's really clear. They are ultimately machines. You hear the mechanicalness going on. Good words, good words. The second mistake I made was shooting too close to my subject. This one was a grave error. I used to take a photo, let's say I'm holding the camera here. I used to take photos of products in my hands an arm's length away. Obviously, every single one came out completely blurry. Film cameras are not like an iPhone camera. They have a focal length. So typically, the best photos you'll get are when your subject is a few feet or let's say a meter or two away from you and further. Usually if your subject is that far away or further, everything will be in focus. Because these cameras don't have adjustable focal lengths. It's just the one. But I had to learn that the hard way and I wasted so many photos on really thinking it was just me and that if I just kept trying to shoot at arm's length, it would be fine. Also, if you reverse that, selfies, they don't come out in focus often, just a warning. But sometimes that can be kind of cute. So if that's the artistic, direction you're hoping to go in, then absolutely go for it. The next mistake I made was having high expectations for your first few roles. It's a great exercise in learning to trust the process and let go of expectation. It's not gonna go all that well. Round one, two, and three. And that is absolutely fine. That's part of the joy of the experience. So I got so excited to shoot my first role on my AF-10. It was actually my old housemate's AF-10, but I borrowed it off him. We were going to Milan. I was really excited, got the role back and realized I had loaded an expired film role into the camera. So all of the colors, I mean, it had worked. Don't get me wrong, the photos were all there but it had expired in 2007. So the colors were like very based in yellow and then there was some kind of navy blue and some olive green. And that was the palette of the role. I was Devo. But I learned a lesson, which is expectation setting. Anticipate that you might have a few duds in each role at the beginning and that slowly you will get fewer and fewer duds. And even now I still get these grayed out photos, these ones with like all the light leaks. And I'm like, what did I do wrong here? Because this has just not worked but I accept, I accept it, I accept it. Sometimes the vibes are bad. It's a learning curve. The next mistake I made was spending too much money on developing my film. I used to go to Snappy Snaps because it was the only place that I knew that could process film. Snappy Snaps, if you're not from the UK, is like a chain that kind of specializes in photography. They do passport photos, stuff like that. They were so behind the times in terms of film processing and it cost the earth. It cost like 23 pounds to get one roll of film processed. And there was no flexibility in what they were offering in terms of product. I think I could either get six by four prints or a disc with the digital copies on, or both, but that was it. So there's two things I'd recommend you do to try and find an affordable, good quality film processor. The first is just look locally. A lot of towns and cities have independently run film processors. You'll be supporting the small business. And oftentimes they are cheaper than going to these big chains. However, I know that there won't be a film developer in every town or city. So if you're somewhere where there isn't one at all, I would recommend doing a postal service. During the pandemic, I would post my rolls of film up to a lab in Birmingham, which is like, 
a while away from me, I'm in London. They would send me a prepaid envelope. I would tick which options I wanted. So if I wanted prints, if I wanted my negative returned to me, what kind of quality I wanted the digitals to be. Then I put my film in, seal it, send it off. And about a week later, I would receive my photos. And it was also more affordable than Snappy Snaps. So those would be my two options. I will say going in person to a local film processor can be a lot faster. But honestly, during the pandemic, obviously I was happy to wait a week. And a week really isn't that long to wait for your nice little roles to get developed. It's also worth saying that these more modern developers pretty much always send a WeTransfer folder, which is just perfect. So much more helpful than receiving a disc, a physical CD. If you're enjoying this video, please give it a like. And I'd also like to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace, for making it possible. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. I've had my Squarespace site for at least a year now, if not coming up on two years. It was the easiest thing to build and it does every function I need it to, which is why it's just the perfect home for me. I use my Squarespace site for three things. One is to be almost like a portfolio or hub so that when people Google me, they can just find out all the information they need. The second is a blog. I find it so easy to write on there. I write posts all about film photography actually, and also about style. So I've got a bunch of resources on there if you wanna know more about film. And thirdly, I sell my Lightroom presets, which are designed specifically for my film photos. They're the presets that I was using to edit my film photos with, and I was so happy with them and people would always ask, so I was like, let's put them online. So I sell them on my Squarespace site. They're an easy and affordable way to just polish up your film photos. And Squarespace enables all of that. So thank you guys. And if you've been thinking about launching your first site, but you've been putting it off, you're like, oh, it's just gonna take so much time. Let this be your sign to do it because I also have a discount code. You can go to squarespace.com forward slash Lucy Moon or use the code Lucy Moon at checkout to get 10% off your first website or domain. It's a good deal. I'm just saying. So that link will be in the description. Thank you Squarespace for working with me on this video. Let's get back to it. Oh, coffee is good. The next mistake I made was not shooting with enough lights. Again, the only thing I'd really shot on before this was my DSLR for videos, which was, it's just a different ball game, or my iPhone camera for photos. And I hadn't really realized how good digital cameras are at light compensation. Where there is none, they will make some. For these guys, however, it is a different game. And specifically, these cameras with automatic flash. It's actually a really good idea to get a camera with an automatic flash because it will be the judge of when there is not enough light. So for the longest time, I thought that daylight indoors in winter would be fine. I would set up my little camera, get ready, take a photo of some nice interior shot, boom, my flash would go off. That can sometimes be a cute look, but that starkness was not what I'd been going for. I live in England. When it is winter, it is dark and dreary a lot of the time. And I just hadn't realized how much more light these cameras need than your average iPhone or digital camera. So my recommendation would be that when you are outdoors in daylight, you are gonna be fine, shoot away. But when it gets darker, when you are indoors or at nighttime, use your flash and set your expectations. Don't expect to get a beautiful low light indoor shot using ISO 200 or 400 film, which is some of the most common kinds of film. I use them all the time. Sometimes I use films with ISO 800 in the depths of winter, but even then <laughs> it's still not great for shooting indoors. The ISO is like light compensation kind of. I don't really know how to explain it. Generally the best photos I take are either outdoors or they're at nighttime at an event. So maybe a club night or a festival or something where the flash looks like it's meant to be on. So yeah, those would be my recommendations. But yeah, the interior shots, not the one. My next mistake that I made was not being still enough. You would not believe how many shots I have where I just didn't pause for quite long enough after pressing the shutter. Is that what it's called, the shutter? I don't know, the button. After taking the photo, not pausing for long enough, and ending up with a slightly moving photo. Oh, so annoying, just slightly blurred. The rest of it would be perfect, it's just lost its sharpness. The shutter speeds on these are good, but they're, again, not the same as a digital camera. So just be aware of that. Nowadays, when I take a photo, I tend to kind of take an out breath as I take it. It keeps me in place for just that second longer. So you can also use this to your advantage. Let's say you're in a car or on a train. If you take a photo out the window, that will all be blurred, but the stuff that is moving with you, you know, the actual car itself will be in focus. That can be really cool. But you take your camera on a roller coaster or on a very rocky sea, 
you're gonna end up with lots of very blurry photos. So choose wisely. The next mistake I made was not understanding the crop of my photos. These cameras are just slightly more cropped in than I expected, and that might sound kind of weird. So many times when I was with friends, I'd go to take a little film selfie, and it would either come out as being all my friend's face and a sliver of mine, or all my face and a sliver of my friend's, or it would just cut half of each. It would just always be closer than I thought it was. So nowadays we avoid the selfies because I don't want to waste a photo. On a positive note, that means that the camera sees more like a human eye, which makes photos just look really nice and real in a way that phone photos just don't quite. They're slightly distorting, trying to be slightly wider, than is maybe normal. It's really hard to explain, but I'd recommend that when you start taking film photos, take one of the same thing in the same spot on your phone straight after and compare them once you get the roll developed and you'll kind of see what I mean. The next one is slightly controversial, but the mistake I made was taking photos of things I don't care about. I can't tell you how many times I would take my camera to a celebration, a birthday, a wedding, something really lovely, and for some reason, out of like awkwardness, offer to take photos of people who I didn't know. And sometimes I'd even send those developed photos to my friend whose event it was, and they wouldn't know who was in the photo. So it's not even like I could give the photo to them as like a nice, you know, offering. It was such a mess. I would do it all the time. And I think it's just like a nervous reflex. So now I'm a lot more discerning about what I take photos of. Another thing I would always do is take loads of photos of buildings and architecture, but not things I particularly cared about or I thought were gonna be good photos. It was like I was doing it out of like a panic, a nervousness. So these days I've learned to be a lot more careful with what I take photos of so that when I get the roll back, I am satisfied with every single photo. We're not just shooting off the last six anymore so I can get access to the other 30. No, no, no. Patience and discernment. Discernment is such a good word, I never use it. The next mistake I made was not paying enough attention to the background. Can't tell you how many times I've gone to take a photo of someone I've got it back, looked at it and realized there's just like loads of bin bags or loads of cars really close to my subject with the number plates in all of them. And it just looks so wrong. My advice for you on this one would be to move your subject, but also move yourself. You can move around, you can go towards your subject, further away from your subject to work out the perfect place to take the photo where the background is not showing too much if the background is not good. You also get it when you're in a busy place and there's lots of people. Try and move your subject a few steps away from where the people are so that they kind of create a wall as opposed to catching people's real life faces like quite close to your subject. Those would be my main recommendations. But yeah, the background's important. She's an important girl. Okay, my final mistake that I made was over editing the colors in my photos. If you followed me on Instagram in 2018, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. So where I get my film developed is an amazing processor. They're called iCulture in Bethnal Green. I love them. They're a family business. I get to go in, say hi, love them, great. But what I will say I've learned about film developers is each one has a different kind of color profile that they use when they scan in your photos to be digitized. And so sometimes I've taken roles to various different film developers and the colors have come back not as I had hoped, maybe not as true to the film, as one would hope, maybe with slightly exaggerated colors in some ways. So when I was younger, I would combat this by over editing the colors in my photos. It was also that like proper 2019 Instagram aesthetic kind of time. I would just suck the life out of them a bit and just pump them with like pinks and warmth and it was just a bit too much. I'd pull all the green out. I remember that, that was wild. But over time, I realized that that just kind of removed some of the pleasantness of the film photo, some of the charm. Nowadays when I'm editing, I'll put one of my Lightroom presets that I developed, especially for my film photos on there. I'll adjust it right down to where I want it. Then I might play with the contrast and exposure slightly more. Sometimes I'll pull the shadows out or down, depending on if I've like accidentally backlit a photo. But generally I try to leave them pretty much as they are. So generally I'll give them a little polish or a little tweak, but I won't go overboard in the way that I used to. As I mentioned, I have a Lightroom preset pack and it's just an easy, affordable way to, again, like tweak the color on your photos, especially if you go to a more affordable film developer. There's four different options in the pack, four different moods, and I use them all the time. So I'll link them below if you're interested. So those are my mistakes. I hope you learn something from them and take them with you so you don't make the same errors that I once did. They were painful and they were expensive, but they're done now. 
but now I take slightly better photos. If you'd like to see some of those photos, you can follow me on Instagram. I share so many over there. As I said, if you're new to film, check out my guide to getting started. And finally, let me know what mistakes you've made and what you wish you could tell someone who's new to shooting film in the comments, because we can create like a useful resource <laughs> for anyone who's starting out or anyone who's already doing it, to be honest. I'm sure I'll learn something. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Squarespace, for working with me on this video. And I will see you in my next one. <laughs> the enthusiastic wave. Where has this come from? Oh, life.